All right. Good afternoon, everyone, and um, welcome to the um, 11th week and 21st session of the Data Science Program. We've actually come a long way. We've come a long, long way, and I'm so excited how far we've come. I believe everyone here has um, has been able to learn one or two, right? So we are going to be going over um, the project. I dropped the project last um, this week, Wednesday, right? I think Wednesday, Tuesday or Wednesday, yeah. And um, yeah, the details, the project details and everything was given to us, right? So um, we are just going to be going over that, right? So looking at um, the expectations and everything, but the, the necessary details and everything you need for the project as, been given to us already, so I'm just doing this so we we kind of um, go over it as a class, and um, also there'll be an avenue to ask questions after this. So just prepare your questions. Um, I'll just give five minutes for that, so we can we can look at we can look at some of the challenges um, we might have or we are having currently. All right, so. So yeah, um, before I before I okay, let me quickly go over the project. Then I'm going. Uh, we are going to talk about some other things. I'll be sharing my screen now. Um, all right, can everyone see my screen? Can everyone see my screen? All right. Okay, so um, basically the initial plan, the initial plan was to have about three, three, two to three projects, different projects. And then you select um, the one of your choice but um due to some some reasons when uh, we were not able to to come up with that so basically we're going to be having just one project here we're going to be having just one project and as you can see it's on fraud detection all right so let's just go over everything here so um you can see that we have the project spanning um two weeks so your project is going to be lasting for two weeks. The period was given on the 13th, 13th of June, and um, we are meant to submit 26th. That is um, in two weeks' time, right? So 26th is going to be the deadline of the project. And I'm I'm going to sound this um, to us that if you fail to submit your project after 26th of June, please, 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 I'm not going to be listening to any excuse at all. Like this is not assignment. This is not our casual assignment. This is a project, right? And if you are not able to 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 um bring out time within two weeks to finish up with the project, then I don't know what else um you want me to do, right? So after the the deadline, the twenty, which is on twenty sixth, I won't be taking in any project. Though any excuse whatsoever would not be condoned, right? So. That's just going to be it. Uh, we are going to be very strict with this timeline, very, very strict. And um, I just want to bring to our remembrance that our project carries um, a, a bigger weight, weight, a much bigger weight than the rest of our, than the rest of um, the evil, um, um, assessments, right? We have um, assignments, we have, um, we have assignments, we have um, attendance, and we have projects. So three of them um, would um, sum up to 100%, right? So your project is taking 50%, that is half of the 100%. Your attendance will be taking 20%, and your assignment will be taking 30%. So if you've done your assignment perfectly, if you attended classes, but you don't, you don't do your project, you know you're already losing 50% 50, 50 and you know what 50% is. You, are, you, you basically are not getting a, a very good grade. So just ensure that you complete, you've started, you've gone through the weeks, you've gone through the classes you've been going through up until now. So don't allow this, this last phase 
to be your stumbling block or what is going to um um or what is going to uh, make you not um come up come out from this program um um with a very good grade yeah so because we are going to be giving certificates and certificates would also be based on on your grade and your performance so that is that is just it I, I just want to remind also we're going to see it as very important very very important so um now we've talked about the timeline now the delivery deliverable so the deliverable is basically what you what i'm expected to see from you or what you're expected to submit right so yeah you're, you're expected to submit a jupyter notebook this jupyter notebook is going to be very very comprehensive it's going to be a lot and it, it marks will be will be given to how organized your notebook is right so if you are the kind of person that don't really care about how you structure your answers or anything you just want to just do answer the question even if you answer it correctly and you didn't, you didn't organize it in a way that someone really needs to understand what you're doing marks will be deducted take note of that so as as far as you're you are, you are going to be submitting um, on a Jupyter notebook to ensure that your Jupyter notebook is well organized, very, very, very well organized. You understand, right? So everything should be in a way that when I'm, I'm marking it or I'm looking at it, I understand exactly what I'm looking at and understand exactly what you are doing. So that's why we're giving you this time to just go through it. Once you are done with answering the questions, you can now still go back to correctly format all the things you've written, your text, your code, and every single thing. So uh, every aspect of the project will be carrying mark. Just take note of that. All right. so, so that is basically it for, for that. Now for the project it itself. So for this project, um, the aim is basically to develop a machine learning model to detect fraudulent transactions, right? Um, I've, I've so many times during the classes, I've, I've hinted at um, fraud, fraud um, detection model, right? So now you're going to actually be building this fraud detection model. So I, I give us um, a data set. I give us a data set, right, attached with, with this particular assignment. So it contains some several variables and some information that you would be using for this particular project. So by leveraging various transaction related features, you should explore the data, engineer relevant features and build and evaluate a predictive model. Right. So um, it doesn't just end there. So you just also try to provide insights on how to detect and prevent fraudulent activities. Right, and I also added that you should feel free to be creative about the different ways you can make your model better. So this project is, as as far as it is assessing what you've done so far from beginning to the end of this course, you, you should you should is also testing your create your creativity and your ability to think outside the box. Right. So marks will also be given to how well your model is performing. Right. So if you get an accuracy score or we look at your metrics and your metrics are not really that strong is also going to affect what you get. So you should pay much attention on how you develop your model and how you evaluate it and tune your hyperparameters to give you a very good model. So there are a lot of things that you are going to be doing, right, as regards building this model. So it is not just straightforward building model. Anybody can build model, but how do you make your model better, right? So we're going to be looking at that too. So these are just the steps you would basically follow. So the first step is data collection, which is straightforward. I've given you a data set. So that data set I gave you, I actually did a lot of work on it because it's actually very difficult to get um, um, a, a, a real data set, especially in the financial institution because of um, privacy issues, right? So um, this data set is is um is just uh, I'm the one a particular data set that I am um, that is available publicly, right? So the original data set is about 1.5 gig in size. So I was able, I tried as much as I can to compress it or to to remove a lot of um of of of, of data to give you that particular size that you have. So 
Yeah, so that is what you're going to be working with, that particular data set. So there are a lot of information there. Just as a data scientist, you have to decide how to approach the entire um, uh, um, problem using that data set. So after you've imported your data set, then you can now inspect it. So I won't just, I won't go over this. We've done this already. So inspect it, just understand your data set, what kind of data is in, in the data set. So just basically have an understanding. So by now you should have done that. Even if you've not started the project itself, by now you should have gone over the um, data set, see how, what and what is in data set and try to understand what you'll be working with basically. So, so there are some things I said here and um, yeah, so I'm not going to give you hints like that, but let me just give you an hint. You should, because I gave you a data set, doesn't mean it is everything in that data set you'll be using. You understand? Because I gave you a data set with 25 colons or 70 colons, doesn't mean it is everything in that data set that you'll be using. We're going to talk about that today, right? We're going to talk about what we call feature selection, how to select features from our data set, relevant features. It's not everything that is going to play a role in giving you a better model. So that's just by the side. So basically you um, 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 decide on how to select the relevant features from the data set that is going to give you a better model, basically. So um, you just do that, um, check your data set, um, review the data types, drop your relevant features, check for missing values and handle them. So all this basic data cleaning process. So the next step is um, exploratory data analysis. So this is the data analysis part, right? Um, in the original um, document, um, this was just what I included here, generate at least three meaningful insights. I said at least. It doesn't mean you just stop at three, right? But three is just the bare minimum, right? If you get three, that, that is good and fine. It will, if you get more, it will only um, um, make much. Um, but at least you should be able to derive three meaningful insights from your data. And just take note, that is why it's important to come to class. I'm adding this one now to the document with appropriate visualizations. So it is not just enough for you to de derive um, numerical insight, just write, write it there. I want to see these, I want to see visualizations represent your insight with these. And another thing is that your visualizations would, your the aesthetics would also carry mark. Understand. So if you just give me a random visualization, just do um, plot does this one. No, you didn't really take time to adjust a lot of things. You you, you won't get um, um, the full mark compared to someone that actually took that time to to make the visualization appealing, right? So there are different components to making a good visual. The visual should should um, um, convey the information it is it is meant to convey very well without clutter. Or, um, yeah, basically, it should be straightforward with conveying the information. That is the number one um, 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 function of a viz. The second one is that it should be appealing aesthetically. When you see it, it should, you should be able to appreciate it, right? So it is easier to, to get information from something that has a good aesthetics. You understand? So um, your visualization should not only be functional, it should all, also have that aesthetical, aesthetic look, right, to it. So, just ensure that you take your time to to um, 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 all these things that we've learned, even the ones we've not learned, you should just check and see how you can make your Vs very, very, very nice. This is a project, this is a capstone project. You not only, it is not only, basically we are going to be giving you mark definitely, but you can use this as as your, as a portfolio, as a project. Why um, I'm going for a job or you're applying for jobs, you can tell them this, what, this was what I was able to do. You understand, and if you walk the interviewer through all this process, without doubts, they will be convinced that you know what you are doing. You understand? So that is why we are taking our time to ensure that all these minor, minor details that you might think are just relevant is also very important. You understand? So for your EDA part, you should be able to generate at least three meaningful insights from your data and represent them with appropriate visualization. So We've learned um, about two Vs library, right? Two visualization library. That is Matplotlib and um, Seaborn. So you can feel free read read um, 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 
um, and go online and check out those things that you can do to make your viz much more better right so after that then you can now um basically um, um encode your data that is data preprocessing so this should just be data preprocessing um So this is basically um, data preprocessing, right? And um, this part is a section, right? You've actually finished data analysis here. Yeah? So now you're not trying to prepare your data for machine learning, understand? So then you can now start um, using a lot of um, feature engineering and data preprocessing techniques, right? Missing value, encoding categorical variable, feature scaling. So I just, listed all this thing here, yeah, not as a rigid rule or a rigid process for you to follow. I'm just giving you an idea on how to approach it, all the steps to take. It's not like this is exactly what you should follow. That's why I say you should be creative with, with the entire thing. So you see number four here, yeah, I said you can try out different feature engineering and processing techniques like PCA, feature selection, et cetera. So we're going to do that today, right? So that's, that's why it's important that you attend all classes. So because I've given you a project doesn't mean that we've ended classes. So there are still very important things that we are yet to discuss. Right. So after that, then you cannot move on to your model development, right? So you do the normal splitting, um, selection, model selection. We did a cap parameter tuning. We did grid search CV. We did randomized CV. We did all those things. So just all the things we've learned so far, just use them in building your model, right? So. You cannot evaluate your model with different metrics, right? So you are the data scientist now. You are the one in charge of everything. So you are the one uh, uh, um, that is responsible for selecting the metric that would be best in, uh, um, in, in interpreting or telling you how well your model is performing, right? So after all this, then I expect you to, to do a little write-up, still in your Jupyter notebook, so I want you to summarize the key insights from your EDA, right? Highlight any patterns or trends observed in the data, right? So this should be a write-up um, at the end. So you should also discuss the performance of your machine learning model and its effectiveness in detecting fraudulent transactions and how it can be improved, whether by, um, let's say, after you build your model, you saw that there is nothing more that you can do again to improve your model. So you can now suggest some things that can be used to improve the model. Let's say bringing in additional features, right? Let's say people that are collecting the data, they should add more features that would help in predicting or making predictions or addition of more data, right? Or just think of anything, right? That can be, that can be helpful in improving your model. So this is going to be a write-up, these two parts. So this, um, after you've done your code and everything, although in, in between your codes, you also be saying some things, you'll be using comments and also summarizing a lot of stuff, right? So, but at the end of everything, I need is I need a, a section that will be summary and recommendations, right? So, so out of it, um, from everything you've done, what, what can you just summarize the entire process? So trust me, if you go through this entire process, you do every single thing. Nobody will need to tell you that you are now a competent, you're now competent in data science. Like you, you've actually gotten a very solid foundation. If you finish and go through all this, this is not going to be as easy as the assignment we've been doing so far, right? This is, this is actually, um, this is actually, um, um, very comprehensive. This is actually a project that people use in interviews, right? So if you can go through this process of, 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 of doing the project, you, you've actually won. Like, even if you don't get any other thing from this program, just doing this alone would, would be enough for you, like to be a very good take home. You understand? So, so that is just basically it for the project. So this is just the conclusion. Um, the project demonstrates the process of developing a data driven solution for fraud detection from data collection, preparation to model de development and evaluation, right? So by following the outline step, you will gain hands-on experience in building machine learning model to address a critical problem. So basically, this is just the project, right? This is a project we are going to be doing. So yeah, that is it. Um, if you have
Wow. Has my video been paused throughout this? Give me a minute, please. Was my video paused or it just got paused now? All right, all right. So you saw every everything I said, right? All right. Okay, now I'm going to be getting, um, taking questions. We have five minutes for that. So if you have questions um, regarding the project, please, can you just indicate by raising your hand? If you have any question, please um, raise your hand. So, yeah, Ademoye, Adego, okay, you're on mute now. You can ask your question. There was someone that said he has a question initially. Is it that you? I don't know. All right, so I think okay, you're on mute. You can ask your question. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Yeah, good afternoon. Uh, based on that uh, question number uh, number three, let me see question number three. That model development here. Yeah. Uh, you said that uh, we are feel free to choose uh, a particular algorithm for uh, to train on a particular algorithm and on different algorithms to choose the particular or to select the particular one that we want. Is it after we perform evaluation to do that or before the evaluation? So I really don't get that uh, area very well. I don't know if you can get me right. Sorry, can you come again? Uh, you see, I'm... Um, on the on the model development uh, model selection part of the yeah. question, uh, you right. said that we are free to go through different algorithms that we like. Yes, yeah. uh, yes. On doing that, is it after we perform evaluation before we choose a particular model? No, 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 no. Um, choosing a model is part of the um um the entire process so model training that is development and evaluation is just an, an iterative process you're just trying out different things to see the one that oh. works you get so once you get the one that that works best then you can now like use uh, just say oh this is the best performing model right so that is model you are going to be selecting right for that particular task you understand? So it's basically an iterative process, and we've tr streamlined it for you, right? Using um um some of the techniques we've talked about, like hyperparameter tuning, um grid search CV, and and the likes, right? So there are so many tools you can use to just get um um the model that is going to be the best for this particular tag. So you just try a lot of them. You understand the tags that we have here. So from the data set, you already know whether it is regression or classification task. So you know the algorithms that can be used for the regression task and you know the algorithm that can be used for the classification task. So you just okay. I don't want to I don't want to um to, to I, I just want to give you the free hand right at this point so to make the we decision. understand. So we understand. Yeah exactly. All right thank you very much sir. All right. All right um you can drop your hand I think okay you're still raising your hand. Okay. Thomas Moses, Thomas Moses, um, you are on mute now. Everybody will speak, don't worry. Yeah, you can speak, you can unmute yourself and speak, Moses. Hello, Moses, you can unmute yourself and speak. Unmute yourself and speak, please. Sir. Hello, your voice is very faint. I'm getting you, sir. Your voice is very faint. I can barely hear you. Okay. Hello. Hello, sir. Hello. Are you, Are you on the earpiece or something? Because your voice is very faint. No, I'm not on the piece. I can barely hear you, Moses. Oh. Try try checking your connection or something. 
Okay. Um, Yusuf Azan, you can go on to speak, ask a question. Mosi, just check your connection or um, your, your settings because I can't hear you. Yeah, Yusuf, you can please go ahead and speak. You're mute now, our class rep. Hello, sir. Yeah, good afternoon, Yusuf. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Yeah, good afternoon. Well, at first, I want to appreciate you, sir, for the classes and the whole of the effort you've put towards this, uh, this program. Uh, I want to say on behalf of every one of us, we are very, very much appreciative. So actually, I've gone through, I went through the project and uh, I had some issues with respect to the features because I just uh, ran over the project to know how the outcome is going to be. But from what I observed, I chose uh, various uh, algorithm, uh, but uh, it seems somehow not encouraging from the result I saw. Uh, then I thought maybe the features might be where the problem is. So I don't know if there is a particular pattern how we could select features that could provide a better result. Uh, this is my personal uh, concern. Okay. All right. So yeah, that, that's a good question. The thing is we are going to be, we're not done with our classes yet. So hopefully we'll be done today. We are going to be talking about feature selection today and um, some other things that would help you um, get a better result, right? So after today's class, um, you can just go ahead and apply what you learned today um, in the project. Um, so, yeah. Okay. Okay, so, no problem. Thank you, sir. All right. Okay. Um, who else was raising up their hand? Dairo. You are raising your hand up. Um, you're on mute now. Please go ahead and ask a question. Dairo, please um, ask your question. You are raising your hand. Or are you not speaking again? Okay, Benjamin. Yeah, Benjamin, Elijah, please go ahead and ask a question. Yes. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Yeah, good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Yeah, good afternoon. Yes, first of all, sir, I want to appreciate you for taking us all through this uh, journey. We appreciate you a lot. Um, sorry, I came to the class a little bit late, and I'd like to ask, um, this project we are writing, are we going to start all some of the processes we do like writing our school project where you do appreciation and other places, or we just start our uh, uh, reading our from data loading to all the the distance you just uh, outlined for us. That is my question, sir. Okay, okay. Um, yeah. The thing is that um, I. You you don't necessarily need to do any 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 extra stuff. I what I just need is your Jupyter notebook that um um that contains your your code as well as answering the questions and um the things that have indicated or put down in the project document. So following the project document, you should just you should just um have it. Uh, you should just it will be um a, a, a kind of guide for you to what you should. Um, or you should be expecting to to have in your in your notebook. So there is no there's no extra stuff to submit. Just your notebook, which contains your code and your and the answers to the questions that are, that are given. So so yeah, that is just it. Don't need to do anything extra. It's okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah. All right. Um, Dairo, are you there? Can you go ahead and ask your question? Okay. Good afternoon, sir. Yeah, good afternoon. Hello, good afternoon, sir. I can hear you. Yeah, go sir, on. my go question on. is uh, regarding the encoding. My question is regarding the encoding of categorical variables. 
So yeah. each category there, I, 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 I try to find out about the unique uh, features in each category there. Yeah. Hello. Um, I found out that uh, there are some some of the features there have like thirty categories, subcategories under them. Yeah. Which means after encoding them, are we going to link them up with the main data frame or what are we going to do with it? Yeah, um, once you encode your, your variable uh, using one hot encoder, it's going to um, convert those features or those categories to, to a, a new column, right? So let's assume you have 30 categories for a feature and you use one hot encoder for, for that. Uh, then we are going to have um, um, 30 columns, right, or 29, while you drop the remaining one. So basically, that is just what you have once you encode your, your, your variable. You understand? Is that, was that the question? Uh, am I missing something? Hello? Yes, sir. Yeah, so once you do the one not encoder, that is what you get. Just... Yes, that's the question, but I found out that. Uh... Hello? Yeah, I can hear you. You found out that what? I found out that uh, there are many categories there, like. Um, the user, this user that each feature there will have like, as I've said earlier, some are having 10, some are having 20, some are having five uh, subcategories under them. So linking them to the main data form will form a lot of features there, like 200 or, or close to that. Yeah, are you, are you afraid um, <laughs> of the numbers? <laughs> You've not seen data sets with- Yes, that is true, that, that's, my, that's my problem. <laughs> yeah, that, that that's not a problem. In machine learning, you can have a lot of no features, right? It's very normal. It's very, very normal. At that point, you have um, 1,000 features. You have one, more than 1,000 features. So we are going to actually discuss a technique today, too, that um, would help in reducing the number of features. So it's what we call dimensionality reduction. So... Just pay attention to what we're to the class today. So there are a lot of things that we are going to be discussing today. The ones we are unable to finish, we'll just move them over to tomorrow's class. So today and tomorrow we'll be talking, um, we'll be looking at techniques that you would use in your project, like very, very useful techniques, you understand? So um you okay. asked the question um regarding the um the, okay. the other stuff, right? So you're going to be looking at that too. And the same thing for you, you're going to also be looking at yeah. At, at it to this class so yeah so just um um pay attention to the class today so um we ourselves we have any question i think we are good to go because of time um okay so if you still want to ask a question please make it very brief yeah yeah on mute now okay sir so my last question is that, uh, is there any difference uh, with uh, the result we get from an algorithm based on uh, the type of method we use in encoding? For example, like myself, I used the label encoder while uh, running through this particular question. When I use one hot encoder, is the answer going to be different from the one I have when I use this uh, label encoder? Yeah, yeah. It will. Like one at one hot encoder is the um is the preferred technique for encoding your categorical variables or your features. You understand? That is that was why we, we paid more attention to it during the classes. So one hot encoder is the preferred technique for encoding your categorical variables. So that that should be what that that that's going to be our, your go-to technique when encoding. You understand? Yes, sir. So label encoder is good, but there are, it's the situations that requires it. Uh, the situations that you need label encoder, but generally you just resort to using one hot encoder. You understand? So, um, 
So yeah, so let's just move on to today's class. Who else have question before we we continue? Well, who else have any question? Thomas, uh, Moses, please, um, can you unmute yourself and and speak? Let me know if it's better now. Thomas, Moses. Hello, sir. All right, perfect. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Um. The question I wanted to ask was actually about the model selection. I wanted to ask, but I later realized it. The question was, um, if I could use more than one um, algorithm to train the data. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Like, you have... <laughs> you, you, yeah. That, that is basically why you have a lot of algorithms. So you can try out different things to see the one that works best, right? So ML, I, I keep repeating this and over and over again. Machine learning is an iterative process. Iterative basically means like it's, it's a loop. You go okay. over it, you try something. If it doesn't work, you try on that thing. If it doesn't work, you try, you try. You basically experiment until you get your desired result. So once you exhaust your options, that is when you know that, yeah, I've tried everything I can try. I've tuned all the, hyper, all the hyperparameters I can tune. I've done all the, this one. I've, I've done this. I've done that. But yeah, this is the highest I can get as my um, accuracy score or whatever, right? So basically, you, you don't just give up or you don't, you don't just stop when you use or try one um, particular, um, particular mm -hmm. algorithm technique you understand so that's okay. just how it is so um the only point where you can just say oh you 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 can't do any other thing is when you are, realize that the problem is more data so when you realize that the problem is more data or more features then you know that yes you can't do anything at this point so if you're working in an organization and as a, as, a, as a data scientist, you realize that we need more data to get a better result. Then you can now go to the management or go to your data engineer and let them know that, oh, we need to collect more data or we need to collect more features. And you also specify the kind of feature that they need to collect, right? So yeah. there are a lot mm -hmm. of that, that involved. It's, a, it's an experimental process, you understand? It's not a, 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 a particular, there's not a particular rule or a particular step that you follow. Okay, sir. Yes, sir. All right. All right, thank you, sir. All right, um, Shonuga, So you can, you'll be the last person to 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 speak before we move on to um. Hello. I said I was doing this. I can't hear you. I can't hear you. I said that was that was a mistake. I was raising up my hand. I can't hear you, Ma. The the line is breaking. The network is not so is not so the rest is not so clear. Okay, can you hear me? Can you hear me now? If you're on earpiece or on external um um Mike, you can probably disconnect and, and use your phone. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, I can. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you. I can hear you. Hello? I, I can hear you. All right, let's just go ahead with today's class. Um, we've spent a lot of time on that. Actually, it's it's actually necessary um to to discuss the project. Um, yeah. So next week we're actually going to be spending um like most of our time discussing the project. You understand? We we will be concluding the topics hopefully tomorrow. And then next week, um, we're going to just have a class discussion, um, how you've been, how the project is going so far, if there's anything, challenge or what have you. And um, remember I said that uh, we would have a day um, as a class where everybody or most persons would um, be given an opportunity to just speak 
um, talk about their experience, what they've learned, and just just have a a, a, a kind of um um class um class meeting kind of uh, an overview meeting of the program so far. But there was something that came to my mind um recently. I was thinking if we are if we had enough time, if we have enough time, I can just list out topics. Let's see, based on what we've done so far, like ten topics or so, and ten persons would select these different topics, and you would come up here, and as as I have been teaching, you will now teach us. You understand? So that that was that was that was something that came to my mind recently, right? So just to just it, if you do this, if you take up that opportunity, trust me, like you, you, you've improved yourself. Like you, you are going to learn. It's, it's a very, very good way to learn. The best way to learn, basically, is to teach. If you can teach something, that means you know that thing. Like you can never forget it again. So it's something I, I, I want to try to do. So I'm still checking the time. If we have enough time, I'm going to just um, um create about 10 topics based on what we've done so far it's not just going it's going to be short 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 topics you understand maybe like 15 minutes or 10 10 15 minutes some kind of stuff so you can just come up here and just discuss or talk about it, it can be like all right come and um, um talk about the different data types we have in python you understand so it can be part of a topic or come and explain how um logistic regression works or come and explain so so and so stuff so these are just going to be short, 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 short topics. You understand? So after this class, I'm going to, I'm going to kind of, um, I'm going to put out a poll and um, see if it's something that we are going to like. If majority um, um, vote for it, then we're going to do it. So that is just one of the idea that came to my mind recently. All right. So um, for today, we are going to, we're going to be looking at um, some machine learning techniques. Right, so very, very important machine learning techniques. Let me share my screen. I've not started sharing any screen yet, so you won't be able to see anything or you shouldn't see anything. So I proceed, hope everyone can hear me clearly and see my screen if everyone can hear and see my screen please let me know if you can see you all can see my screen so we proceed All right, so today we're going to be looking at several things or techniques in machine learning. We've talked about a lot of stuff. We've talked about the different algorithms. We've talked about preprocessing techniques. We've talked about um, some other things, assembly learning and the rest. So today we'll be looking at um, the course of dimensionality. Let me hide this. The course of what dimensionality is and what the course of dimensionality is, we're going to look at principal component analysis. We're going to look at feature selection and we're going to look at building pipelines in SKLN. So we might not be able to cover everything today. So anyone that we don't, we're going to look at it tomorrow. Tomorrow, my plan was actually to look at, um, we're also going to look at regularization techniques. Remember, I, I introduced we were fitting to us in the last class. So, and I thought told us that some of the I told us some of the ways to prevent overfitting. You understand? So, if you can remember that, um, regularization was part of of of, of those uh, um, um, approaches to reducing overfitting. So, we're going to look at it in detail tomorrow. Right. So, so now, um, what exactly? do we mean by the cost of dimensionality in machine learning? Like, um, it's, it's actually a very, very, very important, important issue that is being faced in ML. Someone asked that question about having several features, right? Remember, um, I told us the dimension is the same thing as what? 
in the previous class, I told us that whenever we hear dimension, we are also referring to what? Can I get answers in the in the live chat? I, I, I mentioned this in, in previous classes that dimensions in ML, when we talk about dimensions, what what are we referring to? What exactly are we referring to? Yeah, exactly. We are referring to the features. I said this the other time. We're referring to the features in our data set. Dimensions in ML refers to features. So if we have two features, um, uh, the dimension is just, just two-dimensional stuff, right? So now don't look or um, don't, don't um, think about the rules and column dimension. That, that is a different thing entirely, right? I'm talking about when I'm talking about dimensionality, right? In this um, context, I'm talking about the features. So when, once you have plenty of features in your data set, like 20, 30, 40, 50, 100, your, 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 your data set is, an, is a high dimensional data set. Like it has a lot of dimensions, right? Because when you try to represent it, um, um, when you try to represent it in, in a graph or in a plot, like it's every, every feature that you have is going to be taken in a separate dimension. It's going to be in a different dimension, you understand? So this is going to be a high dimensional data set. Right. So if you have two features and you're using that two features to predict an output, your dimension is very low. You can use a 2D graph to plot or to understand your data. If you have three features, great. You can use a 3D graph to plot your features. But the problem now arises when you have more than three features. When you have like four features now, it's going to be very difficult to plot because what, what um, um, four features is going you have to use four dimensional you have to represent it in a four dimensional uh, um um on plane you understand you have to represent it in a four dimensional plane and we don't understand how four dimension is right as human beings we can interact with just three dimensional with, with a three dimensional world so plotting four dimensional or four dimensional um, objects and above is impossible it is actually impossible. So um, having a high dimensional data set has disadvantages. And I just mentioned one of the disadvantages. You can actually understand the data set by plotting, understand. So, but that is just a very, very, um, um, that, that, is, that is a minor disadvantage. It is not really a big deal. You can still work with a lot of, um, you can still work with four dimensional data set without worrying about the visual aspect of it. But now there's what we call Cost of dimensionality. So let me just zoom in to this notebook. Right. So in machine learning, the cost of dimensionality refers to problems that arise when working with high dimensional data. You understand? So as you can see here, as the number of features, and you see in brackets, dimensions increases, it can negatively impact the performance of machine learning model. So sometimes you might be thinking that, oh, like, I think the more the feature, the better the model. The more the feature, the better the model. In a way, it is true because if you compare one feature data set, that is um, uni um, um, univariate linear regression, right? You compare it with um, two or three features data sets. You know, or once you build a model, you see that the three features will give you a better performance than the one feature. So in that sense, you would start to think that the higher the feature, the better the model you will build with that data. But it's not always true. It's not always true. So if we see this graph here, this graph actually represents how the performance of your model will decrease as the dimension of your data set is increasing. So you see here now on the X axis, we have the dimension, right? That is the number of features. So you can have 0, 5, 10, 15, 20. So basically we have an increasing number of features here. And up here we have uh, our performance. So this place will represent, let's say the accuracy score or whatever metric you are using. So you see that at the starting point, as the feature is increasing small, small, so at, at zero, the performance is obviously zero, right? Because you don't have any features. So as it is increasing, the performance is increasing, right? 
as the feature is increasing, the number, the performance is increasing, as the feature is increasing, performance until it gets to this point. So it got to this point that it, it's got to the highest level of performance that that model can have. So if you trace it, then you see that it, you can trace it to a number of um, features. So we can't really tell um, the number of features. Yeah, it might be 10, it might be 20 or wh wh whatever. So, but basically you get to a point, you get to a, a number of features in which you have the highest level of performance. So any extra feature from there is going to give you a decreasing performance. You understand? So once you have, uh, once you add now start adding features to that um, your data set, instead of it to have your model performing better, it will now start performing poorly. You understand? So as you can see, it is now decreasing, it is now decreasing, decreasing. As the feature is increasing, the dimension is increasing, it is now decreasing. So this is what we call the cost of dimensionality in machine learning. So once you have a very high dimensional data set, your model performance tends to decrease. But the thing is that you can't really know the um, the number of features that will give you the optimal performance. It might be 50, right? It might be 100, it might be 150, it might even be 10 at some point. So you can't really tell because data sets differ. So it's just for you um, to just, just play around with different number of features and see the one that will give you the highest performance. So now this is, this is just a problem basically. So now there are approaches or are ways to tackle this problem in machine learning. So in case where you are doing one hot encoding, you have categorical features um, and um, you want to uh, one hot encode those categorical features, you can basically, um, you can basically, um, you, yeah, you're going, going to actually encode those data to the new data frame. So you'll now be having additional features in your data set. So that's actually not a problem, right? It's not a problem. But the, where it now becomes a problem is now when the number of features start to increase or start to get, uh, um, um, start to become very, very, very large. Like when you train your model, you see that oh, your model is not even performing very well. Right? So you now see, you should now know that, oh, the number of features is actually too much. So, but the thing is that there is no cutoff point or there's no point that um, we can say that, yeah, you should not go beyond beyond this number of features. It's during your um, your training that you're going to know the highest number of features that will give you the optimal performance. So yeah, so I, I just hope you've been able to understand that. So let's just move ahead. And there are some key concepts you need to know. Uh, so I basically explained all these things. So I'll just glance over them. So the cost of dimensionality occurs when adding more features makes data analysis and model training harder. You understand? So the same thing I've said, right? So with more dimensions, data points become sparse, making it difficult for models to learn pattern. So now, um, one of the reasons why your model accuracy or your model performance decreases is because your model is getting so complex that your algorithm is unable to, to map out the patterns in those in, in, in between those features and the outputs, you understand? So it is becoming too complex, right? So it becomes too complex that your model just does anything. It just is unable to understand anything basically. So it just relax and just give you whatever um, relationship or model that it can give you. So that is one of the problem with high dimensional data set. So the implications to it has implications in machine learning Right. So if you have a lot of features, obviously it's going to cause um, lead to increased computational cost. So the more dimensions means more data to process, which requires more computational power. Um, sparsity of data. So your data points spread out. I right? basically you know what um sparse sparse data set basically mean a lot of data set. Like they are they are they are distributed. Like the distribution is um it is not like con it is not condensed basically it is it is just sparsely distributed i don't know how else to explain that if you don't understand what um um, um, um sparsity or something being sparse is right so sparse the opposite of sparse is dense so dense is when something is compressed compressed and compact but sparse is when it is just distributed like it is just a lot of them understand so 
Another problem here is this distance matrix. In high dimensional data sets, data, distances between points become less meaningful. If you remember that um, when we're looking at K and N, K, K nearest neighbor, we said something about them, the algorithm performing poorly in high dimensional space, right? So when you have high dimensional data set, you cannot actually use K nearest neighbor to get, get a meaningful result. So these are just the things that you need to know to um, to ensure that you are getting or you are using the right things to get uh, or to build a, a, a better performing model, understand? So the model complexity too, obviously your model will become overly complex, right? And prone to overfitting. So so this that's just the problem of um, dimensionality. We call it in machine learning the cause of dimensionality, right? So let's just move on. Now um, you can see we have examples here. So in a 2D space, so let's basically um, just leave this because of time. It's just exactly what I've explained. You can read it when you have time. So now we talked about the problem. Now what what is the solution? How do we how do we solve this problem in in, in machine learning? So now we have um, techniques actually to reduce dimensions, right? Let's assume you have 100 features and you just realize that those features are too much and you want to reduce it, but you don't, you don't want to actually drop those features manually because it's obvious, it's possible for you to just drop them, like just drop as many features as you can, right? But you don't want to drop any feature. You, you, you realize that all those features you have are actually relevant to making your prediction, but the problem is that they are just too much, right? Those features are too much. So there's, there are techniques that you can use to actually reduce the number of features without losing any information. So now I'm going to say that, say that again. There are techniques that you can use to reduce the dimension of your data set or the number of features without losing any information or without losing so much information because the alternate way is basically dropping features, right? So once you drop a feature, you've actually lost something that can help you in making good predictions. So once, when you don't want to do that, you can actually use a different technique or techniques to preserve all the information in your data set, right? Why reducing the dimension? So we have two of them. We have PCA and we have CISNE. So um, PCA is what we're going to be looking at. So PCA is a very, very popular algorithm for reducing dimension in, um, in machine learning. So this net is also part of, is also an algorithm too, but we'll be looking at that, right? Because it's main, mainly used for visualizing high dimensional data. So in the case where you have like, let me just quickly explain what this net does. In case where you want to like um, visualize, you have features, let's like say you want to, you have like your data, so you have like five features, right? I want to visualize the relationship between the, those five features. It's not, it's not even possible for you to visualize four features. So now talk more of five. So what CISNET does is that it's, it kind of brings, makes it possible for you to understand the mapping or the relationship between those five variables in a visualization. So I won't go into detail how it does it, but it just projects that higher dimension into a plane, into a 2D plane. So, uh, um, I, I, I wish we have time for that, but um, we, it's not something that you, you are going to be using much often. So that's why I'm not going to spend much time on that. So, but basically used for visualization, when you want to visualize high dimensional data, you can just use TSNE to reduce the dimension so that you can visualize it in 2D, in your 2D um, Vs, in your 2D space or 3D space, but mostly 2D space. So now PCA is the main technique we use in reducing dimension. Remember in the previous class, I, I, I told us we were supposed to look at PCA, but because of time, we are unable to do that. But now PCA is called Principal Component Analysis. Principal Component Analysis. So just keep this at the back of your mind because you are going to be hearing it a lot. Like even if you go for interview, you are going to um, you, you most likely be asked this question because it's a very, very important um, technique in, in machine learning because most of the time you have a lot of 
um, you have high dimensional data set, so you always want to reduce the dimensions, you understand? So PCA is a technique that you use in reducing dimensions, right? And how it does that is actually very complex. How PCA does it, it involves a lot of, a lot of linear algebra and all the likes, but that, 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 that shouldn't bother you. What you should just know is that PCA reduces dimension from a higher dimensional data space to a lower dimensional data. You understand? So let's assume you have 50 features and you want to reduce that 50 features to just 10 or 5 features. You can use PCA. PCA will still preserve all the information in your original feature and translates it into just 5 features. There's a way it does that. It actually um, creates new features and those features that are called principal components. So I said I won't go into details on how it does that, right? You can still go, um, after this, like you can read about that and um, just understand how it works. But basically this is what we use in reducing dimensions in machine learning. So, but what I just want you to know that it reduces or it creates new features called principal components, principal components, right? So principal component analysis kind of maps or um, um, translates your features, right, from a higher dimensional space to a lower dimensional space, right, by creating principal components. So this is, these are um, the tools for reducing um, dimensions, right, in machine learning. And PCA is the most important one here. So this snare is for data visualization. When you mostly want to visualize your data, it's still use, used for that, right? So um we are going to now go straight into pca so these ones are basically what we're going to be talking about um in the um in later class right probably tomorrow okay we'll talk about feature selection today but regularization will be tomorrow in tomorrow's class so um yeah so let's just look at the conclusion here so the cost of dimensionality makes a high dimensional data challenging to work with but using techniques like dimensionality reduction, right, feature selection and regularization, we can actually um, um, build a more effective um, machine learning model. So this feature selection, we are going to go in depth into it to this level. I don't want to talk about it, but it's actually um, another method of reducing our dimension, right? So feature selection is actually um, selecting the most important or the most relevant features in our data sets. You understand? So that's what feature selection is, right? So if we have like 20 features and we want to we want to reduce the number of features, so we can basically use feature selection techniques to just select the relevant, the most important features that we give us that has a strong relationship with the output. You understand that we can now discard the other features and just use those ones in building our ML model, right? So we have um, theory of them which we are going to discuss, right? So let's just move on to PCA, right? PCA, so what exactly is PCA? And um, I told you this is the, um, the um, most important technique for dimensionality reduction. So we're just going to look at it a little bit, right? We're not going to go in depth in depth, we're going to just going to look at it because of its importance. So principal component analysis is a dimensionality reduction technique used to reduce the number of variables um, in a data set while preserving, this is important, like this is actually um, what makes PCA very, very useful, while preserving the most important information, right? So as it is reducing the number of variables, it is still preserving the information from all those variables. You understand so the way it does it is is very very complex right it's not like it's it's it's, a, it's actually uses a lot of mathematical technique and linear algebra and um, a lot of other stuff so it achieves this transformation by transforming the original variables into a new set of uncorrelated variables called principal components so as i said before the new variable that or the new set of variables that PCA we create is not going to be the exact variable, the original variables we have. You understand? It's going to be creating new sets of variables. Those new sets of variables will be representing most of the information we had 
in the previous variables. Let's say we had 10 variables in our original data set, right? And we now use PCA to transform it into just two or three variables, right? So when we now get the new um, set of variables, it's going to be a different thing. It's going to be different from the original variables we have. If we, the, the numbers, the values will be very different because it's actually transforming it into a, a, a what we call principal component. So this principal component is basically the core idea behind principal component analysis. So the process of it getting to um, transform or get this principal component is a lot. Is a lot. You can, if you are very curious, you can just go and um, look it up. All right. So, what are the key concepts of PCA? Um, now, there are three things that you need. That basically, um, 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 three core idea in, P in PCA. We have variance maximization, right? So, what variance maximization mean is that if you look at your data set, right? You look at all the variables in your data set. PCA looks at all of them and picks the one that has high variance, right? So I'm, I'm trying to just give a, a very simple um, explanation on how it does it. He picks the features with high variance, right? So he tries to maximize the variance. The variance in this case is actually the information. So that is the information he's trying to preserve. So those um, um, features with low variance would actually, the, it, it would transform it in a way and merge it with the ones that have high variance and create use it to create principal components. So it, it's actually a lot, right? It's a lot. But basically what it does it is it tries to maximize variance, right? And um basically we have what we call auto orthogonal um orthogonality. Orthogonality is basically um when something is at right angle to another. So the principal component that will be created there so let me just skip this right first before you start getting confused. So these are just the concept in PCA. You can if you can go ahead and, and um, read more about it if you are very curious. But trust me, you don't need to know exactly every single detail about PCA for you to use it, right? But when and probably you want to go for an interview, ensure that you understand at least the core, the key idea in PCA. Right? So these are basically what you should know: various maximization creating of new principal components from the original variables right so and then introduces the dimension by projecting um it into a lower dimensional source space, subspace while retaining most of the variance so variance in this case is information in the original variable so yeah you can you can just um there are a lot of things to unpack in this particular um in, in pca but we're not going to 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 waste much time on that so let's just see how we can use it in sklearn so um we can implement it in sklearn very 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 in a very very simple step the same way we've been using our different um transformation techniques you are still the same way we use pca so just just so you know pca is a pre-processing technique is a feature engineering technique understand so it's part of the feature engineering step where you engineer your features or you prepose your features so that you are going to be getting the best features for your ML um, model. Right. So let's just, as we always do, create um, a note here, a new notebook so we can demonstrate how we can do that. How we can see. All right, so I'm going to be using um, a particular data set um, from sklearn.datasets import load digit. The reason I'm using this data set because it has a lot of dimension, it has a lot of features. It's a high dimensional, right? It has a lot of features. So I'm um, come and say data equal to load digits. Right. Um, let me just say as frame. Also true. I'll come and say data. Dot data. Where is our x? Right. 
x equals to delta beta, and then our y is equals to delta dot target. Right. So if I just come and check the dimension of our x variable, you see now the so what is the dimension? What, how many number of features does this my data set have now? Can, let me let me see if you are following. So how many number of features does the does this particular exactly? So you can see that we are having sixty four features, right? Sixty four features. So um, in this case, let's say um, you actually train the model and ah, your model is not really performing well. So you just decided to well, let me try to reduce the number of features. So it's you can just go on and just start dropping features. It will make sense. That is not actually that is not a, a, a very good approach in ML. So what you do, you try to use the different techniques for reducing dimension. So you can come and say using PCA to reduce dimension our data dimension right so you have to import pca first understand so i think like i remember from sklearn dot decomposition import pca yeah so you can just do um you can see that just basically read what PCA does. So you see that it uses linear dimensionality reduction. Linear dimensionality reduction using singular value decomposition to project data. So this is just an explanation of what of the particular um, PCA object. So you can scroll down and check out all the parameters there and even see the examples that they have understand so these are examples in case you are new to it so yeah so now how do we use pc and now to reduce our features so you use um normally you import your object right you now or you import the class let's just say class and then you come here and create an object of pcm of a pca object and you say um pca and you say PCA and there's a particular argument that you need to put very very important very very important argument it's called n components I think it should be s it should be there right yeah n component so this n component now is the principal component exactly why I explained so here you are going to indicate how many principal components you want to have so the number of principal components that you put here is the number of features that this PCA will reduce your original features to. If I put um, seven here, right, it means that our 64 feature here will be reduced to seven. If I put three, it will be reduced to three. But just know that the lower the, um, the components, the more information that will be lost. You understand so it's not impossible for it's not possible for pca to preserve the old information you get as it is reducing it is losing it's not like it's losing everything but it's, the more information will be lost so you just put the reasonable amount you can put let's say 10 or let's say we'll put 15 understand so basically we're going to be having 15 new features so just come and do the same so now what are we going to do I told you this is, a, this is a pre processing technique. So, what is the next step here now? Please, can someone tell me in the group chat what is the next step based on what we've done before? I'm still waiting. Two people have answered. All right, so because of time, exactly, you are correct. So we're going to fit it um, to our data, right? So we're going to fit it. We're going to fit, but we're not. We're going to use fit transform straight away. So I'm going to come here and say 
ca dot fit you can do fit and then do transform but you can just do fit transform straight away fit transform and then i'm going to pull your x that is your data right so um if you run this you see the we now have We now have how um, we now have how many number of um, we now have fifteen. If you come here and just let me say X um, transformed. I just come and say right. So if I come and say X trans dot shape. So you see that our our dimension has been reduced from what 64 to what to what 15. Like, are, are you understanding what we've been discussing now? Do you do you, do you see how powerful PCA is? So you basically reduced your your dimension from 64, which is very high dimension now, to 15. So you can now go ahead and use this um, um, reduced um, um, transform data. In your model building, basically, so you 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 can just use that and um, continue with your model. So PCA is a very very good to see how very straightforward it is. Very very straightforward. So if I come here and put ten, if I put ten here, see that it has it will change to ten, right? If I put depend any number of component I put here, we're going to have it transform it to this. So if I come and let me let me just say. Let me see um, each component. So I'll come and say trans, trans. I'll say, let me see the first one. You see, these are the components. Each of these values now, they are principal components. If I compare them, let me print this out. Print, come and print X. This is our original X, right? So I'm going to. Okay, this 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 is a data frame, so um, it's not going to index like this. But yeah, so yeah, this is a data frame. So I'll say I lock, right? So basically, this is um, this is the sixty four features we had initially, right? So you see, it has compressed them using this ellipsis, so you cannot print everything out. Let me remove the screen to see whether it will give me everything. Oh, it's still the same thing. So yeah, basically this is just showing you the difference. Now you see this first component, second component, third component, fourth principal component, fifth principal component. So all these values they were generated using a lot of mathematical equation and mathematical um, um, stuff, right? So it were, they were derived from these features we had initially. So the values in the new principal component or the new features will always be different from what you had before. Understand? So this is just how PCA works. So there are actually a lot of other things you can do. So if you come here and say PCA, um, so you can just use tab. Okay, now let's check out the different attributes. Print PCA. Sorry, print DIR PCA. Come here. You see that the attributes of your this thing. So now we can just now. There's something I need to show us. Very important. Whenever you fit something, or whenever you are doing building a model, you use dot fit. You understand that particular um model. For that particular object, like in this case PCA now, in this case PCA, you now do PC.fit. So there are data that is being learned, the information that things that are being learned during the process of fitting. You can actually assess them using attributes that has underscore at the end of it. So in Python, every symbol means something. Right? In Python, every symbol means something. That's why, in this case, when I was telling um, introducing to attribute, I told us to, to ignore all these ones that have double columns. Sorry, double underscore. Right? It's not that they're not important, right? But 
they are not important for what we are doing currently. So these things, they're actually called double um, 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 donda methods or magic methods. They are used when building classes. In Python, there's what we call object-oriented programming. That is when you actually build classes from scratch. So they are used when building classes. So it's not important to us, right? So that's why I told us to ignore it. But the remaining um, attributes here, mostly these ones that don't have anything, that are just like normal variables, right? So these are the ones that you mostly be interacting. That's why I told us to pay attention to them. Now, I want to introduce us to another kind of attribute. So these attributes, they have underscore at the end. So these are the things that, these are the information that we learned or that we, are, that we learned doing fitting that your particular objects to your data. So if I come here and say PCA, PCA dot, I will now come and say end components, right? End components put here, you see that you give me 12, right? If I come and say pca.n features in and put it here, you see that it's 64. So these are the information about your data. So you can just check out, check them out, go over them and see um, um, the basic things or the things that you can get. So there are some that are very important. For example, this explained variance is actually the is an actually an important um attribute that was learned uh, uh, important information so this is the explained variance for each of the principal components that we have right so for each of the um, prince, um principal components we have so if you come and say get explain so all these things are just we don't want to go deep into them but these are just information that you can use or you can check out when fitting your model and um you can just use it to inform your decision as you are building your model, basically. So even for logistic regression, for linear regression, for decision trees, for random forest, once you do um, model.fit, yeah, right? You don't necessarily have to be fit transform. When you do model.fit and you and you fit your model, like, to your data set, you can use um, this particular DIR on your model, and it will give you a lot of information here. Yeah. So you can now see those things that were learned during fitting, and you can now print them out using that particular attribute. So it can help you understand what happened and it give you a lot of important information um, about your model, right? So I just wanted to chip that in, by the way. But the most important thing here is just understand that our the, our model has been trans our data has been transformed from sixty four dimensional space to twelve, and we can now use it to train our um, you cannot train it on our on, um, on our algorithm or any algorithm that you want to use. So this is PCA, right? So you can use it. I'm very sure it's going to be important in this particular project. You can try it out in reducing your dimension. So once you've one hot encoded your data, right? You your data has to be numeric, of course, when using PCA. So once once you've one hot encoded your data, and you now have a lot of um, um, features, you can now put that data into your PCA object and determine or specify the number of features that you want to transform it into. You understand? And you're going to transform it into those number of features and you can now use that newly transformed features to train your model. I hope you are following. So you can see how it, um, these techniques or some of these techniques in MSKLearn is making things easy for us as data scientists. So it's very nice when you know a lot of stuff. When you understand different techniques, you can just use it to do um or uh, build models that is going to perform very well so imagine you don't really know um um, um about pca you will just end up trying racking your brain trying to like see how you reduce your dimension but someone else in the group chat does this mean this method can also remove some important features that might be valuable yeah i don't think you understood what i explained right i said that pca reduces the um features but it doesn't lose the information in those features. You understand? Because each feature in your data set carries an information that is relevant to the output, that is, that is useful in making prediction. So when PCA is transforming it from a higher dimensional space to a lower dimensional space, it's just like magic, right? It kind of retains almost all the information that was in the original 64 variables. It retains everything in the new 
variables or in the new principal components that it is creating. So you are basically not losing um, 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 the information that your features originally had. It is when you manually drop features that you are now going to be losing information or you're going to be losing important features that might be that may help your model to perform very well. Yeah. So, right, there are a lot of things that PCA that happens under the hood for PCA to do this or to come to this point. So we are not going to go into that, but just keep that at the back of your mind. You don't lose relevant or important um, 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 information, right? So that is just it for that. So let's just move on to the other things we have for today. So I hope you understand how you can um, how you can um, use PCA reducing your dimension. Okay. Exactly. So let's just look at this conclusion. So PCA is a powerful technique for dimensionality reduction, widely used in various fields such as machine learning, image processing, and data visualization. So it allows us to reduce the complexity of high dimensional data sets while retaining most of the important information. This part, the last part is the most important part, while retaining most of the important information. It is not just discarding other variables, it's not just throwing them away, you understand? It is using the information from all the variables you have, and it is kind of, um, it is converting them into what we call principal components. So the point, the point it takes to arrive at that, uh, at that principal component is what um, 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 we, we might not be able to discuss, right? So it does a lot of mathematical stuff, right? You use a lot of um, linear algebra techniques to do those things, decomposition, orthogonality, and the rest. So it gives us a new principal component, right? That still retains most of the information we had in our original data sets. So because of time, I'm just going to go um, to the next thing we have here. So by understanding and implementing PCA, like data scientists can eff effectively process that data and improve the performance of their machine learning models, right? So this is very, very important. Like you always want to improve your performance, your model performance. So PCA is, is a good tool to achieve that. So if you if you don't get me, please, when, when this um, the recording is out, please go over it again. Go over it again so you get the idea behind it. So, but just know how to do it in SQLearn and uh, know what exactly you are using it for. So, the next thing we have here is feature selection, right? So, initially, I told us that we had um, different ways to reduce our dimension. We talked about um, PCA. Now, feature selection is actually uh, a different technique, right? A different technique used in. Um, selecting relevant features you understand so there are a lot of things that goes into feature selection so now let's just let's just go over it right so feature selection is the process of selecting a subset of relevant features for use in model training right so it helps improve model performance by reducing overfitting enhancing generalization and decreasing computational cost. So now the difference is that in PCA, we are not dropping any feature. We are not selecting any one particular feature. We are trying to, we are trying to combine all the features together and reduce it to um, um, a select number of features, right? What we call principal components. But in feature selection, we are actually and picking or we're actually selecting the features that are most relevant in making predictions. Do you understand? We are selecting the, um, the, the, the features in our data set because once I give you a data set now, for example, this our um, data set here. Let's, let's just check it out. Yeah, there's a particular data set. Um, let me import pandas as pd. So come here and say pd dot read. No, pd dot read csv and say data 
transaction with CSV. So now this is a data set we've been working with before, right? Now, if I give you the data set to use in um, predict, predicting the price, first of all, you should check the data set. And you see that, if you check the data, you see that not all the variables here are useful. Of course, like obviously, transaction date, um, you can, unless you want to do transformation on it, that you want to convert it to days of the week or a month of the year or those kind of things. But in a trough format like this, it's not really useful. Customer ID here is not useful. So when you get it, that said, not everything will be useful. You understand? Not everything will be useful. Remember in the um in the project document I gave you, I told you to drop irrelevant features. Look at those features that are irrelevant. It's not everything you use in training your machine learning model. You understand? So I've said it once um, over and over again. Feature engineering and preprocessing is one of the most important steps in machine learning. Very, very, very important. Understand? So you have to check out the features you have, and those ones that are not important, you will drop it. So by default, you know already the ones that are really not important here, and we can drop it. But now there are techniques that can actually help us to accurately select the features that are most important. Understand? There are actually um, techniques in SKLearn that helps us to select the features that are most important. All right? So now let's just uh, move on with that. Now there's something you need to note. In feature selection, domain knowledge is very important. I'm going to repeat that again. In feature selection, domain knowledge is very, very important important why do I, what, what, what do i mean by domain knowledge let's say you are in um you're in the medical field or you're a data scientist in the medical field and they give you a task to predict um whether a person um um will, will develop breast cancer or not understand so the data set will have a lot of features right so those features are actually variables that that relates or that uh, a lot of medical um, 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 concepts, right? Those um, features um, relates um, or, or is actually a, um, a medical concept, right? So you get um, you get to understand, or you need to get to understand some things, some concepts, some terminologies in that particular field. For instance, in the medical field now, you need to understand some important or you need to understand important variables that correlate with breast cancer you need to understand those things that can put someone at risk to having breast cancer you need to understand a lot of things right that you know that this this feature will actually make sense in predicting this particular outcome the same thing will go for um agricultural sector let's say you want to predict um whether a crop is developing a disease or not whether a crop is diseased or not right so based on an image so there are features that as an as a farmer you need to understand right you need to know those things that is that would um, make that those crops prone to uh, um, developing diseases so it's apply it actually applies to all other fields so that's why that is what I mean by domain knowledge is important. You have to have knowledge about that particular field, but not you don't need to go to school, you don't need to understand everything, but at least you should be able to read about it, understand it to an extent. If you don't, sometimes as data scientists, we work hand in hand with domain experts that people will call domain experts. So in, in a big company or in an established organization, we don't actually they don't actually leave this particular um um task to the data scientist so they get people that are experts in that particular domain understand unless as a data scientist you previously studied medical course so you already understand all those things about medicine and all those things that are important to include in your machine learning model to give you a better predictive model you understand unless you, you you've gone through the process of understanding medicine but if you've not you always are you will be always accompanied with a domain expert someone that will guide you is selecting important features. So that is usually the initial phase of, 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 of getting your data, right? 
So, but now, in scaling, there are actually techniques, right? This one I just explained is actually different. That is mostly, it will happen iteratively, right? So it happens at the big initial point when you're getting your data and also happens during your model training. Even after you've trained your model, you would, you would just be ensuring that you just be trying out a lot of stuff, kind of meeting with uh, um, um, consultants in various fields to, to show them your model and show them the different features you are using. And they can tell you that, oh, um, this one, I don't think you should really use it. It's not really. So these are the things that you'll be doing, right? So that, that is actually a different thing entirely. But now we have techniques itself, right? That you can use in selecting features in SKLN, important features. So what are the key concepts of feature selection? Why is it um, important? So we have model improve, improving model performance. So selecting feature can help you. Selecting relevant feature can actually help you improve model performance. Let's say you have 10 features and you just use those 10 features to train your model. And in those 10 features, you actually have three features that are irrelevant. So those three relevant features will actually reduce the performance of your model. Understand? So by removing irrelevant features and selecting the ones that are relevant, you it will help your model perform better. Right? So it improves model performance. It reduces complexity. Understand? So it focuses on, on the most important features, right? And removing the ones that are irrelevant. And it also speeds up training, obviously, because you are reducing the number of features that you have in your data set. So we have types of methods or types of feature selection methods. We have filter method, right? We have wrapper method and we have embedded methods. So we're going to be talking about these three different methods and how we can implement them in SKLearn. So filter method now is the most basic method here. Yeah? All right, so as you can see in this um, um, flow chart here, first step is to select, uh, is to get your features, basically is to get your data. And then you now from your, all your features that you have in your initial data, you now select the best subset. So remember when, when we were discussing random forest and ensemble techniques, I told us that it's randomly or that algorithm randomly selects features right so randomly select features and train the model on each of those randomly selected features so that is the kind of thing that is happening here so in this case you just select that, that one is random right but in this case you're actually selecting the best subset or the best features so selecting the way to select or get the best features is what we are going to be looking at as we are moving forward so once you select the best subset you can now use those subsets to now train your uh, model right so that is for filter method. Now for um, wrapper method, as you can see here, the first thing that happens is that you um, you basically, it's just like your random forest, right? When it gets or it selects different subset, subsets of features and it trains them and get the, um, um, the, the accuracy score or the performance metric, and it selects the one with the highest or the best performance metric. So that is what happens here, basically, in your wrapper method. So it uses a predictive model to evaluate combinations of features. So it combines the different features and train them and gets the accuracy score or whatever. And the one with the highest accuracy score will now be selected as the best um, um, combination of features that you can use in um, building your model. So we now have the embedded method. So this embedded method is basically um, is embedded into your algorithm. So we're going to be looking at some of those algorithms tomorrow that uses um, um, this method. Or uh, we've actually also we've actually looked at some of them initially, right? So and when we looked at ensemble techniques, we looked at this particular uh, um, um, method where it selects subset of um, subsets of um, um, features and train your model using those features, right? So it's actually embedded into your algorithm. That is why we call it embedded methods. So these are the three different um, uh, methods for selecting features. We have the filter method, we have the wrapper method, and we have the embedded method. So don't worry, we are going to um, um, demonstrate how we can use them in SQLite. So, so yeah, let's just look at, 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 at the implementation quickly.
I really want us to finish up with, with everything we have for today. So now, remember for filter method, we said that you get the best, um, you get, you select the best subset of features, right? You select the best features and then use those set of features to train your model. So now the method or the way to select those features actually differs, right? We have a law, we have, basically I just going to look at two of them. So we have what we call variance threshold method, and we also have what we call select k best method. So this select k best method is, is the most common way of, of using or getting the best features from a data set. All right, so we're going to look at that. We're also going to look at this variance threshold method. So let's just quickly jump in to sklearn. So all these techniques are just things that you can do to improve your model, right? So these are things that you can do while training your model to ensure that you have the best set of features for pre making predictions. So you don't want to have irrelevant features in your data set. So let's quickly... data am I going to use here? Okay. Let me quickly import. Use this so let's get this and I square right so variance treasure. So SKLN um processes or operation usually follow the same pattern. You import the class. You create an object of the class and you do fit transform. So that is that is basically what makes SKLM very, very easy to use. You don't need to think about how you are going to be using the different um techniques you are learning. So let's let's try to use using select the best word to select. Best features, right? So you come and say, um, okay, best, right? You say, select the best. So, whenever you don't understand, you can also always use your shift and tab and look at the um, look at the function or the class and you see the parameters that you need to include there. So we have two important parameters. We have score func, right? So this is the function we're going to be using to get um, getting the score for each of the feature we have. And we also have k. k here is basically going to, um, is basically going to give you a default or a specified number of features. So if you put 10, it's going to just give you the top 10 features. If we put five, we'll give you the top five feature. Understand? So those are the two parameters that we are going to be using here. So we can just say score form. And now we, we are going to be using chi square. So chi square is a statistical technique, right? So you don't need to go, you can, you can check it out, but it's basically a statistical technique that is used to um, compute the score of each feature so what what this k base does is that it compares or it kind of compares the feature or it assesses the strength and relationship between a particular feature and the outcome All right so in this case um which data we're going to use now so let's just use um we've not transformed this data yet so of time, let's just use set equal 
just to the first answer. All right, so just call me and say, um, So now, this is uh, the not the features in our breast cancer data. So let me see how many features we have. I've got shape. So we have 30 features, right? So in this case, we have 30 features. So basically what we are going to do, hope our Y variable is um, binary. Okay, yeah, binary. Good. So we have 30 features in this case, and now we want to select the best 10 features, right? The best 10 features. So what we're going to do, just come here and say K equal to um, equal to 10, right? Then we run that, we created the object. You can just come and say K best dot fit transform. And then we're going to put our data set here. So what error is it giving now? Oh, okay. Um, I I was supposed to put Y there too. Uh, all right. So basically, it's, it's supposed to make the comparison between each feature with the Y variable. So, so we come and just say new feature. Send to the video to the physical. So we can do the same thing. I come and say new features. You see that we now have 10 features here. Understand? So it has basically picked, automatically picked the best 10 features from our 30 features we originally had here. Right? So it's different from PC in the sense that. It is still giving us because if we let's just quickly check if we check the um the values or the contents of the feature it's like it's still the same thing so let's check new features zero and, and we put x i hope this is the same dimension share x um x zero I'm going to just make this as frame equal to true. So it's going to be a non file here. Right, so print this out. So you see that it's actually still the same thing. So 1.799 plus one, this is just in standard form. So if you convert it to be 17.99, 10.38. So the features are still the same values. Unlike PCA, where it transforms it, you understand. So what what happened here is that it automatically dropped all the other twenty features that are less important and picked only ten features that are important in this particular case. So this K best score, I'll select K best is actually a very very good technique in selecting um, features, relevant features that would use in training our model. So just just um, keep this um, 
um, at the back of your mind too. It's a very, very important technique. So uh, I don't know if we can go any further. Um, so let's just see. We have um, wrapper methods, we have embedded methods. So we're going to be looking at these ones um, tomorrow because tomorrow we don't really have much to do. So um, I would just want us to digest what we've done today. And now we're going to look at pipelines too. So pipelines is very, very important. Uh, it's, it streamlines our entire process from pre-processing to creating our model. So I'm going to look at these things tomorrow, right? So um, that's going to be it for today. Um, I, I really want us to, to close on time too. And um, I'll be taking questions now. But before I take questions, let me just recap what we've done today. So today we, we looked at treating high dimensional data sets. We looked at the cost of dimensionality in machine learning. And we looked at the disadvantages of having high dimensional data sets. Right, and we also looked at the different techniques. Uh, we looked at basically two techniques today in handling high, high dimensional data. So we looked at PCA, and we also looked at a particular method under filter method for um, um, this one is for feature selection, basically. Right, you select feature, but at the same time, it is reducing the dimension. Right, but the main purpose of feature selection method is to select important feature. We are not, the, the, the primary goal here is not to reduce dimension, just to select important feature. But as you're selecting important feature, you're actually at the same time reducing the dimension. But PCA is different. It is not, it does not, it's not selecting important feature. It is reducing the main aim of PCA is to reduce the dimension. So that is why it is under the dimensionality reduction techniques, you understand? So we are going to talk about this other one, wrapper method. Embedded method, we really don't have much to talk about, but we'll just look at that too tomorrow. So we'll also look at regularization techniques, right? And then look at, um, we looked at PCA in depth, or not necessarily in depth, but we looked at the core idea in PCA and how we can implement it in um, SKLN. And also look at feature selection, um, the importance of feature selection and the different types and we picked out um, a particular method, which is select k best method. So this select k best method is actually one of um, the most commonly used one, right? Most commonly used um, um, method for selecting um, features in, in machine learning, especially in scikit learn So for this method, um, you remember we use the particular core so that all the different scores we can use. So chi-square is just one of them. So if you come here and um, we say print, print DIR, and um, we say think for key best, Um, select k best. Uh, you see that we have a lot of attributes here. You can see we have um, okay. We have attribute there. Okay, basically, you can just use your shift tab to get it. You come here and say shift tab. You come to your score function here. You have, um, okay, I don't know where, where they wrote them or but should be somewhere here. Okay, yeah, you can see it here. We have your, see your chi square here. We have F regression. We have neutral info classif, right? We have F classic and you have select percentile. So these are the different score functions you can use. So chi square, you can see that um, there are criteria that it needs to pass for you to use a particular function. So for chi square, it is used for non-negative features for classification tasks, right? So in our case, we're actually having a classification task and the features we have are actually non-negative. You understand they're positive features. So for this particular one is um, mutual information for a discrete target. So your target is uh, the data type is a discrete data type. 
So for this F classic, it uses ANOVA, right, between labor feature for classification tags. So for, for regression tags, we use mutual info, info regression. So if you're doing a regression tax, you don't use um, chi square, you don't use mutual info classif, and you don't use ANOVA, you use mutual info regression and you use F regression, you understand? So these are the different score functions that you can use in this select best um, 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 class here. So we are using chi square here because our task is a classification task and our feature are actually non-negative features, but there's positive features as you can see. So the, um, we actually have a lot of things we can go over and um, look at to be able I'm just going to end it here so we can review what we've done today and um, revise ahead of tomorrow. So please, this this particular video class recording will be dropped this night. And I actually want to plead with us to watch it or go through it again before tomorrow's class because we'll be continuing from where we stop and I'm going to be ask, asking questions based on what we did today. Understand? So I believe we will, we'll be able to pick up tools and techniques that we would apply in our project. So yeah, that is that is one of the reasons why I I I, I ensured I did or uh, we had these classes, especially this particular um concept, right? So that you can you can um have tools and um know how best to approach building models, right? So if you use the what we've done already, you would get a model, but it might not be as good as when you apply some of these techniques that we're going to be discussing. So I believe most of the questions you have will be answered during the classes we'll be having today and tomorrow, all right? I, I really hope we conclude and finish up with everything tomorrow. So I'm going to be calling it a day now. Please, if you have any question, um, indicate by raising your hand and um, we'll just speak, we'll just unmute you and then call it a day. All right, Yusuf, your hand is up. Can go on and speak. Go ahead and speak. Hello, sir. Can you hear me, sir? Yeah, I can hear you. Please go on. So my question is still uh, relating to this uh, this uh, date time feature. I want to know, as in, what is most recommended? Are we to <laughs> convert feature? it? Hello. Which feature are you talking about? This date time. Date time. Yeah. I want to know what is best there, if uh, it is best to do the conversion and working with it or removing it totally. <laughs> that, that's exactly why you are doing the project. So it's for you to determine what best, what is the best approach to take. So you can try the two. You can try removing it and you can try leaving it and, and comparing the, the results or uh, how removing it will influence it or how leaving it would influence it. You understand? So I, I won't be in that position to to give you or tell you all this. Thing. So it's just an experimental process. It's a learning process for you. So you just learn and see um, the outcome. Yeah. Mm, yes, sir. But uh, uh, there was something I tried actually. I tried converting it uh, after some conversion. After I made conversion, I was having some errors. I wasn't able to progress. So uh, that's why I just uh, I just put the question forward. Oh, um, all right. If you're having an error, I think that's a different case entirely. So please just, just send it or just come to my DM and then um, you can give me details. Okay, no problem. Thank you, sir. All right. Um, Philip can go on to speak. I'll mute. Yeah, Philip can go ahead to speak, please. All right. Good evening, sir. Can you hear me? Yeah, good evening, sir. I can hear you clearly. All right. Um, thank you for the session. Always insightful. Okay. Um, I actually asked the question. I dropped it. I agree. Maybe you didn't see it. I was asking in that PCA, like when applying it, do we have a, a particular limit we shouldn't go beyond? Let's say I have about 64 and I'm trying out, I'm, re, I'm trying to apply the PCA, I'm using like 15 or so, taking the features down to like 15. 
is it a particular is there, is there a particular limit I can I can push up to? Can I push to two? Can I push to three? Is this still okay? Will it affect? Is there any effect on the data? Then for the other part of it, the project um, question, I also want to know for when we are carrying out all those iterations, the trials and all the scientific process, um, do we need to put them in our, what we are in our notebook, the one we are submitting or at the end of it to just pick out the one that is, that we are applying, that's what we should, we should submit. Okay. All right. um, yeah, thank you. So for the PCA, there was something I said. I said that the lower you go, the more information you lose. You understand? If you have 64 features initially and you indicate in the PCA object that you just want two principal components, obviously you're going to lose a lot of information. You understand? So it is advised that you always don't go too low, you understand, so that you can still retain um, a, a reasonable amount of information from your initial data set. So you don't you don't go too low if you have a, a very high dimensional data set. So you always just um, pick a number that is reasonable. So if you have 64, you can try, you can just try, you can try um, 10, you can try 15, you can try 12, you can try eight. So you can just try different number, but don't go too low, you understand? So I will just keep saying this, data science, you know what science is, right? That's what we, that is why it is data science. Science is an experimental endeavor. It's an experimental process. The same thing with data science. It's an experimental process. You experiment with different things and the result is going to guide you on how to proceed or what to do next, you understand? So it is not a clear cut process that this is what you're supposed to do. This is how you're supposed to do it. If someone use a particular approach and you try it for yourself so that it will give you a different result. So is, there's there's no um, um, particular path that you are supposed to follow. It's just but there's a guide basically. What I just said now is a guide. I didn't give you a specific thing to do, but I gave you a guide, right? So that is just how you approach data science, right? So you get good at it by doing a lot of, um, or, or by by practicing basically and working with data sets. So you are going to see, you are basically training yourself to. The same way machine learning model is training by looking at a lot of data, by practicing a lot, you are training yourself to be uh, uh, picking out nuances, to be picking out details and things that you cannot just, you, you, you don't know from just learning. You know it from practicing, you understand, from experimenting. So there's some things I, can I, will, I, I might not be able to explain to you. You can only pick that up when you practice, when you, when you, when you do the stuff, you understand. So there, that is, that is for that question. So you don't go too low, understand? So you don't lose a lot of information. You just try to stay at a very good point. If you have like 100 features, it would be unreasonable to just make it two or three or five, you understand? So you can make it 20, 10, 15. Like, it's not like it's, it's, it won't work if you make it two or five, but if you do it, you can try it, build your model with those two features, you see, you get the result and if the result is good then if it's not good then you know that you need to increase the principal component so for the second question yeah i want to see every single thing everything should be documented like every single process should be documented from start to finish and they should not just be documented they should be well arranged and well documented this is not just for me right definitely you i'll be grading it and giving your mark but it is also your portfolio project. You are going to be using it as an evidence that you've done something. So once you show anybody or a recruiter or someone, you are trying to tell someone that you're a data scientist and they ask you, okay, what have you done? And you show them this project. Trust me, they'll be very impressed. They'll be very impressed, not just on how, on what you did, but how you documented it on, how you, you arranged everything and how you organize it. So I want everything to be there from start to finish. You understand? Is that okay? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. All right. So I'll be taking two more questions. The reason why I'm stopping today is because I don't think I can go on further. If not, I would have um, proceeded and would have, as we've been overshooting before. So I'll be taking two more questions. Yeah. And Benjamin, please go on to speak. You are on mute now. 
Uh, good afternoon once again, sir. Yeah, good afternoon, Benjamin. Yes, sir. Um, I'm sorry, I have to ask this question again. Some of us are slow in learning, and I know you are being so patient with us. But I want to ask again, sir. Um, how would someone, the way sometimes you used to just uh, say, that, let's drop this one, this one is not important. How, as a data scientist, how do you know, okay, this one, I don't need it. Let me replace it or let me let me drop it. How to, is there any physical description how we can be able to recognize some of these uh, rows or columns that we don't really need in our data? Thank you, sir. Okay, um, yeah, thank you. So let me just give you an example now, and you are going to, it's going to be, you are going to be answering me. Let's say you want to predict, um, um, you want to predict the class, economic class, class of a particular person. You have a data set that you, or you want to create a data set that will be used in predicting the economic class of a person. Let's say you have three classes. You have um, um, high class, um, middle class, and you have the lower class, right? So you have these three classes. So obviously the high, the high class will be the first class or whatever. Are those people at the top, right? The rich and the rest. Middle class are those people at the middle between the rich and the poor. And the poor class are those people in between. So you now have, you now want to generate features that will be able to make those predictions. So let's now start to look at some features. So um, um, monthly salary now for each person, is it a good feature or not for making that prediction? It's a good feature, sir. All right. Um, age, is it a good feature? No, sir. Mm, I I don't know, but age can have a, a kind of influence, right? It might have influence because as most people grow older, they might begin to accumulate wealth and everything. So it might be a good feature. So um 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 educational status is it a good feature or not? Yes, it's a good feature. Exactly. So I'm just trying to 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 help to make you understand how to see all those things. So you are not just working with data for the sole purpose of working with data. You need to understand the context behind what you are doing. You are trying to predict the economic status of, of individuals. So you should already know that the features that we use to make the prediction should have an influence in a way. It should have an influence, basically. You understand? So when you see features that doesn't really correlates like it doesn't really like correlate like let's say for instance now you have a feature of height like do you think height is a good um feature for making predictions of the economic status of an individual no sir no sir it, it actually doesn't you understand so those this, these are the kind of things that you put into consideration so this is just a very simple example but in cases where you have a problem you look at the problem itself the the context of the, you have to understand the business, the thing you are trying to do. So this was this was what we, we looked at in the initial um, 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 classes. We looked at data science, looked at the different um, stages of data science, looked at business understanding. You need to understand the business, data understanding, you need to understand the data. So initially, before you even start applying all these techniques that we are doing now, you can just start dropping columns like, in, in this particular, let me just go back to this particular one here. Um, okay. So in this particular, in this particular retail transaction data set now, customer ID, is it in any way going to like make influence, does it in any way influence the price, the price outcome? Like it doesn't have any correlation like by just thinking about it, you don't even need to do any correlation analysis or whatever so you know that customer id doesn't relate with price in any way so you drop it right so transaction date transaction date might um date will actually have an effect but not in this rough format you have to convert it to the 
specific uh, um, format that will be useful, right? Like months, days. That's why when I gave you that assignment the other time, I told you to convert to days um, of the week, months of the years, and the rest because you can't use this particular data format for any kind of analysis, right? So unless you convert it to that format that you cannot use because days of the week might have an influence on price, right? Maybe on Monday, people people come out more to buy or they don't come out more to buy, right? So there might be an influence or correlation of a sort. So this is just that these are just the things you think. As a data scientist, you don't just think about the technical aspect. You you think al alongside the business, right? The the context of the data, how the data, where, the reason why you are even doing performing the tax at the first place. So you need to take some time to understand that before proceeding. So it will help you a lot in in selecting and doing all those things that you'll be doing while building your model. So I don't know. I hope that I hope that is clear. Um, is it Benjamin? I hope that is clear enough for you. Wow, sir. So you're genius. You're you try, sir. Thank you, sir. All right. Thank you very much. So is there another question mm -hmm. before we follow it with you? Okay. All right. All right. All right. I'm going to be, we're going to be calling it off now since we don't have any other question. So tomorrow we'll continue from where we stopped. I will try as much as we can to conclude. All right, so please um, ensure you enjoy the rest of your day and um, look at the class recording as soon as it's, I drop it. And I, I also want to believe that we've been revising, right? We've been revising the previous lectures, going over the videos, sections of the videos that we don't understand, right? So just ensure that you keep abreast with everything that we've done so that the project will not be so challenging for you. So. Yeah, I understand that um, it's easy. Like there are a lot of things we've done. Like there are actually a lot of things we've done. And to keep um, um, to, 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 to keep abreast with everything from beginning to end is not very, very easy. So the best way to do that is to revise, right? The textbooks I've given you is a very, very good reference point. So just use that with the materials we've been dropping. That's why I take my time to do create materials like I actually create these materials and drop them in the class group chat for you to use as a reference, right? And also when revising. So please just do yourself that. Um, do yourself good by doing all these things. So um, at the end, we are all going to come out very, 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 very proud of ourselves. So yeah, that's going to be it for this class. Please, as we normally do, drop what you've learned today in the group chat i'm going to be going through it definitely and um also please start your project please start your project right and another thing is that let me just tell you now in case some of you might be bothered about the the accuracy score of your work at the end the accuracy score will not carry as much weight as the entire process you understand so if you can if you go through or if you have a very 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 concrete process like i look at your work and everything is the, the 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 step you took is very 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 good then your accuracy score won't actually it won't affect you a lot let me just tell you so just ensure that you you start the project on time so that you don't um, get pressured um as the deadline approaches you understand so um yeah enjoy the rest of your day and um thank you very much for your time